Okay, now for our interview with Dr. Jack Sarfati. I started by asking him whether he liked being referred to by some as a hippie scientist. Well, no, but you want to know something? That's not me. I was never a hippie. Okay. That's that's uh, that's uh, the uh, the publishers trying to sell books. Yep. Some of my guys were hippies. I was ne- you I was like a, bo- a hippie. Yeah, I was a bohemian. That's different. Bohemians. Well, when you're too young to be, you're too young to be a hippie. I mean, too old to be a hippie. The hippies. No, 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 no. The hippies. No. Sixties. No, I was born in thirty-nine. You were born in four, around forty. Forty. Yeah. Be? Beat. That's it. More of a beat. Copy. More of a beat. Bohemian. Yeah. yeah. yeah we went. I mean, I, I we had rich girlfriends in limousines. You know, like, Sweet. you know, like. Uh, but but if you were born in forty, isn't fifties more your decade than yeah. six? I was born in sixty-seven, so the eighties yeah. are my decade. Yeah. Don't you consider the fifties to have been? No, the fifties. I was a teenager. I was still a, a kid. I was yeah. You know, right. I mean, I was uh, at Cornell in the late fifties. But, but the sixties really didn't happen the, until the late sixties. The sixties. Yeah. No. But no. No. I was right in the middle of the, the everything. I mean, you know, okay. Ira Einhorn. So you could have been a hippie if you had chosen to be a lot of my friends were hippies, but I always liked money too much. I like Jaguars. I like fast cars. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, mean, I never espoused the hippie way of life. So you okay. just you, you just look like one. Yeah. yeah. And um, oh, especially then I looked really, really well. Actually, well, I, I did want to ask you. Almost everybody did. I do. I did want to ask. I mean, you, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders. He was a hippie. Yeah, you know, Bernie. It, and Bernie is almost eighty, right? Bernie, we're about to say within a year or two. Yeah, yeah seventy nine, a year or two. But same area. I knew lots of Bernies back then. You know. Right. I mean, you guys just keep talking. I'm and Einhorn, you know, Einhorn, who Einhorn was, Einhorn would have been Bernie Sanders today if Einhorn had not been framed or whether he did or not with Holly Maddox. You know, he was uh, he was much more charismatic than Bernie and the same kind of. Milieu, and he had all kinds of powerful people backing him. He would have been running for president today. Interesting. Yeah. What about since we're talking about yeah. hippies, LSD? Is that something? Uh, I that knew would, Timothy Leary. Is that? <laughs> yeah. I knew Tim Leary. <laughs> uh, t- uh, did, I, did you indulge? Uh, a, only a couple of times. Only a couple. Actually, strangely enough, Leary. I was at Brandeis in 1960. And when Aldous Huxley gave his Doors of Perception talk at MIT, I was actually there. And Leary was still a professor at Harvard then. And Leary contacted me. I was a graduate student at Brandeis in physics, you know, a national defense fellow. And uh, Leary wanted me to uh, do the uh, LSD at Harvard for experiments. I didn't, I didn't do it. I was, I was very straight. I didn't do it. But then I knew Tim afterward when, when um, we were at Esalen. Uh, you know, in, in the '76, uh, and Nixon uh, released Leary from prison in the care of George Koopman, who was this Army intelligence agent who was funding us at at Esalen. And that's how Leary Leary when Leary was released from prison, he became part of our group at Esalen Physics Consciousness Research Group, you know, financed by Earhart. This whole thing is very, you know. So you you never used LSD to help in your thought process when it comes to deep thinking. I may have. I think I took LSD two or three times. More yeah. for a social reason as opposed to... No, actually, I have one... Oh, okay, one time... Okay, he says, I mean, I don't care. Uh, one of my uh, mentors at the time, this must have been the late 70s or early 80s, was Marshall Nafee. Marshall Nafee was a uh, United Artists Theaters you know, billionaire, friend of Ronald Reagan's... Uh, he was like the godfather. If anybody wanted to make a movie when uh, when um, Francis Coppola, who I knew uh, was part of his Rat Pack, when Coppola wa- wanted to finance movies, he would call it Marshall. In any case, so Marshall, <laughs> I did LSD with Marshall because he was kind of like a wizard. He mm-hmm. was, uh, and uh, and at that point we did like a. I had like this time travel experience where I was back with Marshall in ancient Egypt. In this, in this, uh, in this kind of emerald palace sort of thing, and also I had like an experience where uh, uh, I was a, a Grail knight, <laughs> wounded, <laughs> wounded on the battlefield with a spear. <laughs> I so mean, this so, is why you believe in time travel. But now we figured oh, it out. Yeah, well, yeah, I've experienced <laughs> it mentally. Mentally, it was pretty real. I mean, that's a. But that was Marshall himself was like a wizard. He was 
and he he was like you know he he was special and and uh, uh, he's dead now so I could talk about it but it was because of Marshall that the strategic defense initiative was done by Reagan see that's a whole story that if you want to get into how that really happened uh, well I think uh, we I, should we will get into that a little bit because we've had someone assert on our show that the SDI the cult Star Wars was what ultimately led to the U.S. developing Tic Tac, which I know you don't agree with. But anyway. Well, uh, let me put it this way. I hope that's true. I hope that's true. I don't think it is. The reason I don't think it is is because I know all the top guys in physics in this field, like Kip Thorne. I was asked by CIA guys and DOD guys back in the mid-'70s during this uh, uh, SRI remote viewing episode. That's all in how the hippies save physics. We were. I was asked to work on two problems. Okay, how does consciousness work from a physics point of view? No, no, no spiritual bullshit. You know, pardon my French. Uh, how does it work physically? Uh, and how do UFOs fly? I was also, as a child, you know. Uh, Around 13 years old, I was part of a government-sponsored Super Kids project out of Columbia University, uh, and we were also guys from from the government would come with these brilliant kids that they collected, and uh, we were also asked to think about flying saucers, and they tested us to see if we had paranormal powers. Okay, and it was because of that project. Uh, that I was sent to Cornell by, on a full scholarship when I was you know, almost, still 16, well, you know, 17 years old. Uh, my mother, did, I was a single mother, living a single mother. She didn't have any money. I was at an Ivy League school. Everything was paid for. Okay. So this is a long-term thing. Also... Well, you also you have I know you have a childhood story, too, that I yeah, want right. to get yeah, into. But yeah. let, let, let's go back to your statement yeah. that... You would love for these Tic Tacs yeah. to be U.S. technology, yes. but you feel that you know all the key thinkers in this area. Yes, and also, I I, I don't want to sound egotistical, but I'm just being truthful. I know how Tic Tac works, and I know none of these other guys, from what I've seen, they don't, they don't even have a clue how, to, how it works, okay? The only way they could have developed it is because time travel is involved. If the stuff that I'm working on now gets developed in the future, okay, and then they went back in time, you know, with time loops, with time travel, they say, well, it is. But let's go back to what you acknowledge as a very arrogant statement, yeah. which is that you know yes. how Tic Tacs work, yes. but essentially nobody else does, or certainly nobody knew it 20 years ago in time right. to have created this. Yeah, exactly. Okay, but what exactly. about all these, because we were also talking about yeah. Star Wars, SDI, yeah. Black... Well, I was involved in that, see? I okay. was involved in Star Wars. Okay, but you've got billions of dollars going into Black projects right that's okay but if they're too stupid they don't understand what they're doing i don't care how many billions of dollars here look at uh, what's his name look at bloomberg he's got he put out hundreds of millions of dollars and he's a schmuck yeah. uh, pardon well, me I mean, <laughs> I mean i mean he doesn't have trump's charisma so it does so the money doesn't matter well, if you don't and, have the and idea. i'm not and i'm not one that often <laughs> yeah. gives the government a lot of credit for uh, spending money and wisely and so so i'm thing. with you i that's can see thing. everybody i've been in the government is stupid yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, but, I can't believe how stupid okay, they are. Okay, but what about the stealth technology that the government? Well, developed? that's good. Yeah, stealth, but that's pretty conventional stuff. And actually, what I'm talking about is it does have stealth capability as well. But and they may have gotten that, according to Colonel Corso, Phil Corso, they may have gotten that from retrieved, uh, you know, sources. I mean, we don't. You know, that's a whole controversial area, right. and I'm not particularly expert. But bottom line, but, stealth is an example of a project coming. To being developed, a, a significant advancement that was kept secret for a long yeah. time. But there's no way to keep this kind of thing secret. For one thing, stealth is all classical electromagnetic field theory. It does not involve gravity theory, which is what Tic Tac is. And these guys, the engineers, who are, they could be very good in electrical engineering, but they don't understand Einstein's theory of gravity. They don't understand it physically, and they can never have gotten it. Uh, because I get so much opposition right now from the establishment on how I think Tic Tac works, because there's one key idea they missed. 
secretly, I just got, I'm not going to say exactly what he said, Hal Putoff, you know who he is, right? Hal Putoff. I know you've been mentioning his name a lot, but tell, okay. tell us who, ha- who he Hal is. Hal Putoff, okay, Hal Putoff was, okay, he was a, a, a naval officer in naval intelligence back, you know, 60, he's my age, no, he's older than me, he's a, actually, five, he's 85 now, he's older than me. He had the highest security clearances, worked with the NSA, he became a, he's a PhD laser experimental physicist, uh, he uh, did. He was in charge with uh, with um, uh, Russ Targ, uh, the CIA remote view, remote viewing experiments with Pat Price and Uri Gello, all that in the seventies that I was involved with at Stanford, with Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut running it. It was all a CIA project, and he is the chief scientist at To the Stars Academy right now. Okay, uh, who are trying to explain the Tic Tac, okay. and also a uh, Chris Mellon. A Christopher Mellon of the Mellons, Carnegie Mellon University. Richard Schiaffi Mellon is his, I don't know, his uncle or something like that. Chris Mellon is 62 years old. Uh, you know, he Yale, skull and bones, all that kind of stuff. You know, so you, you understand what I'm talking about? He was Deputy Assistant uh, Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, okay? And he says they don't know. So he, he's certainly in a position to know. Chris and, Mellon. And, and what is it that Hal says? Hal doesn't have, well, I, I just got a privileged thing from it just two days ago, so I got to be careful what I say. But um, uh, Hal basically agreed with me that um, that the guys, the establishment, they, they're just not ready to accept this key idea. But I think Hal, Hal is now on my side on this because uh, you know, uh, Hal and I go back a long way. So... Uh, there's this one key idea of how matter couples to gravity in Einstein's equation. And there's something called the speed of light. And all these idiots, pardon me, but you're a bunch of idiots. <laughs> all these idiots, they think the speed of light has to be the speed of light in vacuum, even though it's inside a material. Okay, And the point is you have to use the speed of light in the material. Uh, and then once you realize that, Everything about Tic Tac is easy to explain. That's their stumbling block. They have a mental block about this. And, and when the, you say they, you're referring to who? I'm referring to a lot of my colleagues who should know better. I'm okay. referring to PhD, even people in gravity. Because let me tell you something. You read a textbook on Einstein's theory of, of gravity, and the coupling, <laughs> the coupling between energy, between the like the matter fields that create gravity and the gravitational warp field itself, that cup, the right, they set it equal to one. It's a constant. They don't even want to deal with it because what they're trying to do, most of the physicists doing in this field, they are mathematicians and they're looking for mathematical elegance and they forget that that coupling from an engineering point of view is very important. You've got to see what it actually is, okay? And so they've forgotten things, things that, electri- that come normal to an electrical engineer they haven't done. So it's a matter of over-specialization, you know, like the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. What I'm saying to an engineer, to an electrical engineer, would be sort of perfectly obvious, okay? So that's the stumbling block. Uh, see, the problem is this. If you read any of the standard papers in the field, when they're talking about warp drive, or they talk about time travel through wormholes. They say, well, the problem is it requires so much energy to do it. See? And that's and that's you see, and that's not true. You could actually do it with with a with, with a triple A battery. You know, it, it the, the Tic Tac itself does not require a lot of energy. Yes, and the reason, it, and you know that to be true. See, that's a, that's now an observational fact. They observed the Tic Tac what going from eighty thousand feet down to fifty feet in like less than two seconds. And there's no there's no jet engines. There's no flares. How's it going to do that? It's going at you know hundreds of G's, maybe thousands of G's. How's it doing that? See, there's no way it can do that by conventional propulsion, and and if it was using a lot of energy, if you calculate how much energy we involve, it would it would burn up the whole planet. You know, there, there's very little. It's stealthy, so to speak, and that, it doesn't even make a noise. Right. It may may make a little noise. But okay, so so explain in layman's terms the best you can what you've discovered, I discovered as to how, how that tic tac is doing what it's doing. Yeah, well, the way it's doing it, it's because. There's a special material that is the fuselage. The fuselage is built of something called a metamaterial. And there's a lot of research going on in metamaterials now. And uh, 
And what happens is that if you pump electromagnetic energy into the metamaterial, it can have a certain kind of what's called a resonance. And in that resonance, the speed of light inside the material can go down to a very small number. And since the speed of light, a little bit of math, fractions, you have to know fractions, <laughs> since the speed of light appears in the denominator of Einstein's coupling of matter to gravity, it's in the denominator, and it's in the denominator to the fourth power. I could draw, oh, there it is. <laughs> okay, that's going to mean a lot to about uh, point something a percentage of our of our people. Okay, since the, C C the speed of light's in the denominator to the fourth. See if I can even say that because we got a lot of people on audio. Is that eight pi? And then gravity. Yeah, capital G Newton's constant, capital G, and this is called the index of refraction of the material to the fourth power, mm -hmm. and this is the speed of light, the speed of light actually in vacuum. But but everything is here. This 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 uh, index of refraction n gets very big in a resonance. Gets very big. Whose formula is this, by the way? Einstein. Okay. This is Einstein's formula. Well, the this part is mine. Putting in the n. They, Einstein only had this. He didn't have. Okay. The what's end. unique about the n that you? The played? n is the is the response of the material, which which uh, everybody left out. Okay. It's called the index. The fact of that the speed of light is not constant. It's in a vacuum. It's constant. Yeah, but, but once it interacts with the material, yeah. it can slow down. It can slow down. In fact, it generally does slow down. It's called refraction. It slows down. The reason for that is what, what what's happened with the speed of light? The speed of light are photons in vacuum. When the speed of, when photons move through the vacuum, they encounter what are called virtual electron positron pairs. They're like charges that are fluctuating in and out of existence and they scatter off those virtual electron positron pairs and that slows it down but that's vacuum that's the speed of light in vacuum it's still pretty big 186,000 miles per second right all right but then when it gets into matter there are other charges there so that's that's the key of the, these metamaterials which can alter the speed of alter light. the speed of light dramatically and man is capable of making these metamaterials oh well, they're, we're making them all over the place oh, so there's hundreds i mean it's a huge in, metamaterial industry now what do we use metamaterials for as we speak well they're using them for you get like what are called perfect lenses you can resolve images better than what's called the refraction the, the diffraction limit uh there's all kinds of applications for sensors it's a big industry Okay. okay, I don't want to. You know, I mean, so 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 man is perfectly capable of making the metamaterials that would be needed for Tic Tac. Well, not necessarily. No, no. They're, 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 right now we're making them on a gross level. They're making them kind of crude, with, like with long wavelengths, big wavelengths, microwaves, stuff like that. According to Eric Davis, who is a physicist who has some intelligence connections he let slip that some of the that that they have retrieved tic tac material in which it looks like the meta material is down to the nanometer billionth of a meter level and i don't think we know how to do that yet i mean there's, there's you know maybe i mean that Re, and, and it was retrieved how and well where? that 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 that's not you know that's sort of classified i mean i don't know but but allegedly it slipped out one of the rumors are that these Metamaterials found in Tic Tac or flying saucer uh, retrieved materials, that if, with the electron microscope, it's like it's like wheels within wheels, like Russian dolls. It's lattices. It's like metamaterials within metamaterials. It's like a, a fractal sort of different scales, but it goes down not only to the billionth of a meter scale, but maybe down to the angstrom atomic scale. So this is What's this the most is very so, so yeah, yeah, right now we can make it at centimeters or make it at millimeters, but making it down that small, that's the problem. Okay, you know what it's like? It's like my professors at Cornell built the atomic bomb, Manhattan Project, okay? Uh, John Wheeler, the theoretical physicist back in the thirties, they understood in principle how to get a fission reaction, right? And so they understood it conceptually. And that's the same way when I say I understand tic tac, I understand it conceptually in terms of the basic equations of physics, how it works. Mm -hmm. But how to engineer it, to engineer it, they had the Manhattan Project, they had to learn how to refine, you know, you, to get plutonium and, 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 and uh, the different, it was it U-235, whatever it was. And that was a major job that took billions of dollars and thousands right. of physicists. So keeping it high level, yeah. what we would need to do is be able to develop this metamaterial. You're right. saying we already make metamaterials. My question on, on that subject yeah. is, is there anything close that we've made to this type of metamaterial? Well, that that, if it is, it would be classified. I don't know if it is, but, but I mean uh, that you know of. 
No. What's the most sophisticated men of material? That no, you're no, that, no. That, that's that's the big stumbling block. That's what that's okay. that's if uh, that's if if uh, if I get to meet with uh, President Trump, which they're trying to arrange actually. So I'm supposed to meet with him. Them. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's gonna okay. Happen. So making the men of material. Okay, if, if Trump says here's a blank check, Jack, here's your billion, whatever you need. Okay, then we're gonna then that's the first. Uh, okay. So the, number one is getting is making the proper meta material. What would be what's number two key to the, actually making a tic tac? Oh well, that once you have the meta material, you're in like Flynn. That's I mean, it. <laughs> that's it. And then what what would the power source be? <laughs> it could be a, a, an Energizer Bunny ra- uh, battery. <laughs> it could no, it'll be more than that probably. But in principle, it could be tiny. So, in so prim- the meta material in is principle, so, yeah, wait, yeah. in principle it could be the electrical power from your brain from your EEG because there is evidence for that. You know, there's this uh, Colonel Phil, you know about it, Mike. There's a uh, Colonel Phil Corso uh, says that the uh, the uh, little green meadow, the, the grays, whatever they were, they had uh, they were they were they were controlling this, the craft with their brain waves. And there's enough energy. There's enough energy. And actually, you know, I, I can't. Uh, there's some other kinds of, but I realize that I'd be revealing a confidence from Hal, so I can't say that. But the amount of energy required is basically very small. They used to think it would take a Jupiter, the whole Jupiter mass, the whole mass of Jupiter to do it. Right. No. Okay. So, yeah. So let's continue to talk about energy yeah. and power. So what is it? A lot of people have said, I think you've said, that once you develop this Tic Tac, that we've solved energy issues for the world, that no longer that's, do we need fossil that's, fuels. That's true. Explain that. How do these metamaterials, how would we utilize these metamaterials such that we well, no longer need fossil fuels? I mean, you know, okay, okay. You saw Iron Man? He puts on a suit, he flies. You're talking about that. <laughs> I mean, uh, you make a, a suit out of metamaterial, you can literally fly like Superman. You know, it, it goes back to the, like... Uh, because, the, because you've defeated gravity. Yeah, you're controlling the gravitational field locally with small amounts of energy. Mm-hmm. And, and is, there, is there a field around yes. the Tic Tac? Yeah, it's a gravity field. And... You're generating... You're generating a what's called a, a, a confined... It's called... Technically, it's called a near field. Okay, the Earth's field... The Earth's field, the field we're in, it's called a near field. It's not, it's not gravity waves radiating out. You know, it's, it's it's like it's it's like the field from a battery, like the Coulomb electrical field. It's a static field. It's not, it's not wavy. So what you're doing in the metamaterial itself, you're able to generate whatever uh, confined gravity field you desire i mean you have a computer this computing am, am, what am i mean? thinking of it correctly that it's really counterbalancing the gravity field from the earth yeah so you're yeah. creating a gravity field from the tic tac that's equal to the gravity field yeah of the and earth, also it's which a, net netting out and, to zero can, y- yes is that yeah roughly, yeah, r- roughly speaking yeah okay. well okay let me th- let me tell you how what's called the alcubierre warp drive works you have a starship okay you have a starship and um in the in the nose of the starship, the nose of the starship, you have a you're creating an, or, a, an ordinary attractive gravity field. What attractive gravity field does? It can, sort of contracts the space. So since the space is contracting, it's like pulling the starship. Mm-hmm. And then and then behind the starship, in the tail, you have an anti gravity source, a negative repulsive gravity. And what does? It's expanding the space. So that so that's that's pushing it from behind, pulling it from the front. But the ship itself. Locally, it's not moving at all in its local gravitational field. It's not moving through space. It's control. It's it's folding space. Do you have a, Frank Herbert Dune? Remember in Dune, they folded space. They used the spice. It's like that. It's like Frank Herbert's. Dune. So that you're saying these concepts from these old shows and movies are really real concepts. Oh yeah. Well, yes. The, the, it's a matter of perfecting them. It's a matter of perfecting them. Yeah. You know, in many cases, what's happening that a lot of science fiction, what's happening is that people are receiving inf- they're doing precognitive remote view- remote viewing of future science, and it's going into the science fiction. You know, it's a, that a lot of science. The reason science, the reason Jules Verne and H.G. Wells are so accurate in many ways, is because they're actually seeing future developments. See, that's the way physics works. Turns out that's quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, back from the future information plays a very key role in what's called entanglement, quantum entanglement, all these quantum computers and quantum cryptography and all that stuff. So it's a, it's a very pretty picture. So the point is this: the way the Tic Tac works. If you had a graduate student on his PhD oral exam, and I was his examining professor, okay, I would go up on the blackboard, I'd draw this thing, I'd say, now tell me with this, how could you get something like Tic Tac to work? And in 30 minutes, any good 
physics graduate student would figure it out because it's not that hard. Once you have the right idea, once you're pointed to the right idea. Have we ever controlled gravity in any way? No. So no. No, not 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 not. But, but at there's this been time. we may control in the future, and they may have gone back in time. You know. But there, but but correct me if I'm wrong. There's been decades of research about control. Yeah, but gravity. by idiots, they don't understand what they're doing. But come on, uh, everybody's an idiot. No, no, come no, on. No, 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 they're smart. No, they're, uh, let me. What I say, <laughs> I'm I'm an idiot at times too. Everybody's. Uh, what did Einstein say? Anybody who's not made a mistake has never done anything new. Well, you're 80 years old. Yeah. Uh, you're an idiot that you didn't come up with it sooner. Well, yes. No. The re- okay. Now let me. T- that's right. Now let me let me explain. That's actually a good point. I want to get into that a little bit. When I was 13 years old, and I had this weird, high strangest contact, the entity, which said it was a conscious computer on board a spacecraft from the future, said that I was part of a that they had selected me and a bunch of others, a few others, bright, receptive minds to teach their technology too, and so I was told that I was going to do this. And I was also told I was going to meet... It took you long enough. Yeah, it took long <laughs> enough. But, but and wait, and I was told I was going to meet the others in 20 years in the future. This is 1953. 1973 is when I met you know, Werner Erhard, Hal Putoff, uh, all the guys from, the, from uh, Edgar Mitchell, all the guys doing the remote viewing experiments, okay? And they have had similar experiences. In fact, there's a tape recording. This was all a CIA thing. There's a tape recording of my initial meeting at, S- at SRI back in 1973 where this whole thing comes up where, um, where uh, uh, Russell Targ, one of the key guys, starts talking about, well, we think that these flying cells are coming back from the future. And I said, oh, my God. That, I, I reminded my telephone call experience. And then... This guy, Brendan O'Regan, who was Edgar Mitchell's right-hand man in the CIA project, says, oh, yeah, we have data on several hundred experiences like that. So this whole thing, and it, it, this is a CIA tape recording that is, is out there, okay? You can actually hear ever, us talking in 1973 about this. Like, you know, so so this is everything, everything I say can be corroborated and tested. Am I correct that you've said that you think that this could be developed in 10 years' time? I could be developed in three years' time. It depends on the amount of money. Depends on the amount of money. Okay, look, let's look. Like, hey, it depends on who's doing it, too. Let, let's look at the uh, coronavirus now. What They just said it's going to take, what, three years, two, a year and a half, three years? The Israelis just announced they're going to have it in 90 days. Because you know, they're smart. It depends who's doing it. Okay. So you believe, based on your formula and your discovery, that we could take that information, turn it into a tic tac. As far as how long it would take depends on how many resources we throw That's at it, but yeah. anywhere Are from you... one to ten years. Yeah, anywhere from one to ten years. And this is what you want to share with President Trump. Absolutely, just what I want to share with Trump. And I know I could sell Trump in ten minutes because Trump and I we come from the same area. I'm a little bit older than him. I'm also a New Yorker. I understand how he thinks. He knows I've been supporting him from from before from the time he announced. Oh, by the way, the other thing is, you know, since I belong to a, to a club in London, exclusive uh, club in London, they used to call it the Spies Club during World War II. A lot of guys from MI5, MI6. It was right close uh, to the old embassy, the American embassy, okay? And, um, and I was uh, told then, I was told in April of 2017 about the coup d'etat against the president by, an, by a former American naval intelligence agent who was stationed at the embassy since retired, a former Navy SEAL, okay? And he had, matter of fact, I don't know what side he was on, but I was told about it. I warned, warned my people, friends I know, you know, who are close to Trump. So I know this to be a fact, okay? And um, uh, well, Trump well, knows well, my name. Trump knows we're, we're going to We're going to talk some Trump. Yeah. So going back to the number of people that potentially could have the same solution that you have. I mean, I guess there is, it, there is no you're way. basically sitting here saying that I don't know how many billion people there are in the world. Uh, yeah, Michael, well, you could look that up for us, yeah. but <laughs> you're the only one. I'm the only one. Yes. This. Now, now, now. There and by the way, Michael, do me a favor and over, I, I meant to have the patent and I think it's, Oh yeah. The Pais patent. Yeah. yeah I, think we'll I think it's, I think it's either in there or over there. Can okay. you just kind of see yeah. if you can find yeah. it? We'll just keep going yeah, yeah, yeah. while you look for yeah, it. Yeah. But, um, because yeah, I, but, and let's go ahead and talk about him. Yeah. Uh, the Salvatore Pace, P-A-I-S. Yeah. Okay, Salvatore is an interesting case. First of all, his patent has been completely debunked as far as the physics goes by Eric Davis, who's a smart guy. Eric and I don't get along on everything, but I sort of... Uh, 
Sal is asking the right questions. He's asking the right questions. He's tuned, he's tuned in. And it's, a, it's an enigma going on there because there has to be really like a, a, an investigation what's really going on there. Because it's hard to fit. first of all, he's ta- Sal is talking about using tremendous amounts of energy. He's not, he's, he's, no, he's, so he well, never, well, let's, what was your he, assessment he, of the patent? What did you think of the patent? I think it's a. I think he's asking the right question, but with the right, he doesn't. So he's in the ballpark, because the no, patent, not in his salute. The patent's not going to work. The patent's not going to work. And the first, the patent there's no gen, there's no Einstein. There's no no physics in it. There's no the It's only electrodynamics. The only thing that might work there, he may have some kind of a propulsion system, but it's not warp drive. It has nothing to do with gravity. It's nothing to do with the gravitational field. He says, you know, it's it's a bunch of. Uh, Words that there's uh, it doesn't connect with anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's asking the right guy. Yeah, he it'd be well, great. It, if, it starts with a discussion about gravity and in the various forces. Yeah, but but the, there's and, nothing and the, in his patent. To... There's nothing in his patent that corresponds to real physics that I know. Okay, and yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, there's nothing. There's nothing there. There's not, you don't see this there. If you don't see yeah. this there, let, let me. I, yeah. I, I thought. Let, let me read this part because I want to get have you help explain this for our listeners yeah, yeah. and for me. There are four known fundamental forces which control matter and therefore control energy. The four known forces are strong nuclear forces, weak nuclear forces, electromagnetic force, and gravitational okay. force. Okay, stop right there. He's already made a mistake, which a lot of people make. Gravity is not a force. Gravity is not a force. It turns out what we consider the force of gravity are actually electromagnetic, what I call reaction forces. Incur- See what Einstein said. That, that shows. Okay, right- but is it improper to use that term? Yes, it's Because everybody says gravitational force. I know, and a lot of the, 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 this is my point. This is exactly my point. A lot of high energy physicists, who are good high energy physicists, they also use gravitational force, and but they don't understand general relativity. That's not what Einstein said. And okay, even, let's, even let's, let's okay. excuse so his the use right, of the, so right use there, of the word there's force. a physics mistake. Okay, okay. The, the, this is the important. The next yeah. sentence. Okay. In in this hierarchy of forces. The electromagnetic force is perfectly positioned to be able to manipulate the other three. Do you agree with that? First of all, you don't have to manipulate the the other the the, the, the actual forces in nature are three. There's the electromagnetic force, the weak force, and the strong force. The weak force and the strong force play no role for tic tac. Not important. They're there. They might play some secondary role. Not important. The only thing you have to worry about is the electromagnetic force, how it interacts with the gravitational field. What what Einstein showed was that the gravitational field gives you all possible what are called real force-free trajectories. It is the ba- the gravitational field is the basis for motion that that happens under no forces at all. What's called free when you when when you jump off a ladder. You're freely falling. When the astronauts going around in the space station, when they're going around in orbit and they're freely floating, they're what they're called. They're moving in a force-free, what's called time-like geodesic. That's in the form of a circle or an ellipse or something like that. So the gravity, according to Einstein, this is what most physicists even who uh, who never took a course in general relativity properly, they don't understand that what the gravitational field. It's the reference arena for force-free, weightless, free, uh, free-fall free motion. Here on Earth, we're standing here on Earth, we feel weight because we are actually accelerating upward, but we're not moving because the space-time is curved, the space is curved. So in order to stand still, in order to stand still, see electrical forces, what they're feeling, well, okay, when you get into your BMW convertible and you, zub, you know, stomp on the gas and you feel like that's, that's G-force, right? When the when Fravo, the commander Fravo is trying to be in a dogfight against the Tic Tac, he doesn't have a chance, of course, and then he stumps on, you know, he feels G-forces, right? That's, those are all electromagnetic forces from, from the thrust of the jet engine. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Okay, so that's the first thing. And, and well, let's, staying yeah. on that for a second so I don't forget this yeah. question. If you were inside the Tic Tac... Would you get G-force or no, not? No, zero. That's the whole point. Okay. Weightless. The guys in the t- Tic Tac, they're weightless. Even though from the outside, it looks, and from the outside, it's going at you know, 50,000 miles an hour and doing a U-turn. And it looks like the G-force would be like impossible. Inside, it feels nothing. It's weightless. They, in fact, they have to wear magnetic boots so they don't float around. Just like, see, that's well, the well, whole that point. Would, that would that's counter a- our, our, our friend Mike Turber's 
claim. Are you, are you aware of this Mike Turber no. that we interviewed? So, you know, you're our you know, 10th or 12th episode yeah. digging into yeah. this, but it started with this guy, Mike Turber, who used to be in the Air Force, who says yeah. that he's got friends at Plant 42. Are you familiar with Plant 42? And uh, where... A little bit, not much. So yeah. supposedly that's where major secret projects are developed. Yeah. So, you know, uh, Lockheed would be there and Raytheon yeah, yeah, would be yeah. there, et cetera. So if yeah. they're working on something for the government, they can work on it there yeah. in total secrecy. And so yeah. he... Bl- claims that these are made by the U.S. Yeah. military yeah. and that they were made by, I believe you said, Lockheed and, and Raytheon. Yeah. And, um, and then went on to say that he, uh, he he implied that he may have actually ridden on one, yeah. um, but that the speed of it was only 1G. So it went from Palmdale to D.C. in like 84 minutes yeah. so, that it, so that the G-force would never exceed – 1G, and that's why I wouldn't just zip there because he's because well, they may have something, but it's not Tic Tac. It's not warp drive. It's not. It's, it's it doesn't do what Tic Tac does. Well, he's saying this. It does do what Tic Tac does, but it, it went at a modest speed because otherwise the G force. Well, would then have he been, doesn't. Then uh, he's full of shit. <laughs> Pardon me. Full, you have me on debate him, okay? I'm from Brooklyn, man. <laughs> from Brooklyn. <laughs> so basically, you're saying you're saying if there was a, a, um, a anything inside the Tic Tac, it's not going to feel gravitational force. So there's no reason, in, not G force, et cetera. So there's no reason for it to go at a particular speed. It can go no, at any speed. No, no reason. If whatsoever. if a human being is on Tic Tac, he's, and, fly, he's fly, he has to have a magnetic uh, boot so he doesn't float around, no matter what it's doing from the outside. Because he's controlling the locally, locally it's like locally it's like it's like you're free floating inside. See, you're controlling the local gravity. It controls its own path, and for that, by the way, you need a supercomputer. What you need is a, a conscious artificial intelligence that's embedded into the metamaterial the fuselage itself that is computing rapidly. How much electric field do I put in this part of the fuselage? How much electric field do I put there? You know. It's got to be computing this in order to dogfight, in order to keep maneuvering. Okay, what, what are you talking about? The electromagnetic boot. Okay, the the uh, what what's happening? You have a, a battery, let's say. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe it's a nuclear. Maybe it's a little uh, nuclear fission battery or something like that. Whatever, so, some source of electrical energy. Okay, it might be a regular battery. It may be something better. Maybe it's a cold fusion. Who the hell knows what what is? But you need some energy source. And what that energy is? It's like a battery, and the it it gives a. Um, uh, uh, an electromagnetic field permeating the interior thickness of the metamaterial. You know, mm-hmm. the metamaterial is it's like okay, the metamaterial is like a bunch. It's it's like a nervous system. There's like a bunch of nodes. They're called quantum dots. They're like artificial atoms, and uh, and each and each the little pixels like pixels on a screen. Okay, and so each pixel is controlled by a little electromagnetic field. Just think of a okay. Think of a capacitor. Let's be real simple. You know, a capac- mm-hmm. parallel plate capacitor connected to a battery. Okay, and you turn and you can control the electric field in, uh, in the inside the capacitor with how much voltage, how much you know voltage you turn on. So each little each little pixel or each little capacitor, you have a bunch of capacitors that are. T- that are tiling around the the entire fuselage, right? There's like like a network of mm-hmm. capacitors, and they each have their own little batteries. Okay, and you have to know each battery. It's a variable voltage source. You have to know how much voltage to put on each pixel because a certain amount of voltage will generate a certain gravitational field right around that little capacitor. So that all has to be computed by a supercomputer because it has to be done in real time. Okay, so this is you know this is why that's the that's the conscious that's the AI part of it. Mm-hmm. This thing is this thing is a conscious computer. We know. See, okay, what you couldn't this, be well. Let me tell you, you, you couldn't fly this thing like a drone. Yeah, like the way we fly I mean, drones. Yeah. So yeah. you got a guy on the ground being the pilot of the drone. Uh, and no, he's uh, no, no, no. That well, maybe you could, depending on the side. You might be able to do it that way. You might be able to do it. But chances are, it's it's controlling itself. It's a, I think it's probably it's an autonomous AI controlling it. There may be a, a real person inside or not. It doesn't. It doesn't have to be. I would say the simplest. It's probably. Uh, no, because the other reason you couldn't do that because then you have to wait for the delay time of the electromagnetic signals going from the ground control unit to the thing, and there's not enough time to do that. It's got to do things, in, you know, much faster than that. So it's got to be autonomous. Yeah, the, in principle you could do what you say, but it wouldn't. 
if I was designing this thing, I mm. guess I will be designing this thing. <laughs> you want it to you want it to be as fast as possible. Okay. Okay. And that 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 would slow it down if it's that waiting. That would slow it down. That would slow it down. for the, the signal. Oh, and not only that, you could interfere with it. You could you could you could hack it, right? You know, electronic uh, uh, countermeasures. You could do countermeasures. You could you could jam the signals, right? They're doing that all the time. That's a, that's a problem in drone warfare. So okay. You so if it has a, its own consciousness. Yeah. It's own how intelligence. do you? How do you? you it's own intelligence. Not, yeah, how it, do you program it then? It, it you don't have that. It programs itself. I mean, <laughs> but how? Okay, so how does the U.S. use this uh, to? Well, we're designing uh, it. I mean, we'll design it. Uh, okay, the consciousness part. In principle, it could do it without being conscious. Okay, it could just do it. But, but I have my own reasons to think from my own experience of what I was told because I was contacted by a Tic Tac when I was 13. See, a Tic Tac basically contacted me in 1953. That's okay. Now, yeah. you say, why did it take so long? Let's get back to that. That's okay. a good question. Why did it take so long? Because first, of all, I sound like I'm a crazy nutcase, right? Who should be put in a bad cell for saying this? Thing, I wasn't right? going to say that, but I'm uh, glad you yeah. did. No, okay, okay, <laughs> you know, uh, okay, all right. People get upset with me when I say that. <laughs> right, okay, all right. Yeah, I'm from Brooklyn, right? <laughs> and um, and 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 I would always say whenever the story would come up, see, truth is more important than reputation. And also, I've been funded, you know, by the powers that be. Thank you. Uh, to be independent, be an independent voice, okay? Uh, I left academia because academia is too stuffy for me. All right. So I'm, I'm saying this crazy stuff because it, it really happened. And other people are coming out of the closet too are saying this kind of stuff. It's more like, it's like, was it LGBTQ, whatever that is? We're like, it's like that, right? <laughs> you guys are coming out of the closet also. Coming out of the closet also. It's, it's Look, now safe. It's now safe, right? And we have our civil rights. You're a civil rights guy, right? Yeah, I get hired yeah. you're a civil rights guy. You know? We're all us contactees, you know, you know that we're not. All right. So, well, and by the way, you're talking about a real thing, so-called discrimination against people with these type of thoughts. We've talked exactly. They, yeah. they talk about it with yeah. pilots, how the Navy is now telling pilots, exactly. "Hey, feel free to come forward with this. We're not going to laugh at you." Yeah. And in academia, you would be marginalized if you said some yeah. of the kind of stuff. And, you're I, and about. I guess I was, but of course, the powers that be came in and gave me independent funding. That's what I've been doing, right? Okay, so right, but the thing that marginalizes you is to say that you were visited as a thirteen-year-old right. by someone from the future. Right, coming up with something like this, yes. you're not going to be marginalized for the, your for this. Um, yeah, but when they say I uh, got formula. it from them, but I see I got it from them. I'm an idiot, right? <laughs> I'm just receiving that. I'm just the messenger. Okay, this formula <laughs> that you said is unique to you, you've taken Einstein's formula and modified it yeah. a bit. What do you mean you got it from them? Okay, well, to, okay, the, the, this has to how. All creativity happens. See, when when Mozart, you know, said he would hear his symphonies. You know about this. He would hear it, and he was just dict. He was he was just dict. He was taking dictation. He heard. He was like hearing future, future performances of his own symphonies and just writing it down. That's when I write these things down. I just go like I'm channeling, right? I don't know. I just I just write. It comes it, it out. Couldn't be coming from your own brain. Well, it is coming from my own brain, but 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 who knows? I mean, you believe it's coming from something external to your brain. Well, let's and put your it brain this. is channeling okay. it. Okay, yeah. Okay, I think that's the most. Let, let, let me let me let me give you a, a, a why I may believe that now. Uh, if you look back, if you listen to the tape, we'll try to get this tape of the CIA recording of my interview at SRI when I was first asked to go there in 1973, uh, uh, and I I talk about I received a single phone call from the computer. Okay. Then uh, several months goes by, all kinds of things going on, and I'm down in Austin, New York, with a guy named Andrea Puharic and Uri Geller, the Israeli psychic. And and um, Gell, uh, Puharic, who was an intelligence guy, uh, 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 Captain, well, it's, 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 uh, you should check on who Puharic was, very important figure. And uh, Puharic wrote this book called Uri, gives me a copy of the book. I'm just back from Europe meeting Werner Erhard in Paris, all that stuff. And I go down uh, to my mother's place in Brooklyn with my girlfriend, Sharon. I give my mother the book. Uri was a big, he was on a Johnny Carson show. He's like a you know, celebrity. My mother's reading the book. She says, Jackie, Jackie, look, this is just like what happened to you. And I say, what are you talking about, Ma? 
<laughs> it says, don't you remember the computer on board, the flying saucer contacted mm-hmm. you? You were on the phone for weeks at a time. You were on the phone for hours, and I finally got angry. And I picked up the phone and said, who is this? Who is this? And this is my mother, my Jewish mother, right? And <laughs> Millie. And, she's, and she says, she hears, she hears a cold, metallic voice saying it's a computer on board a spacecraft, and they please, please put your son back on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and and she's and, and someone says, "Don't you call up here again!" Slams the phone down. That's a you know. Uh, now this really okay. <laughs> my mother remembers. How many of these phone calls did you have? I remember the first call. My mother remembered three weeks of hours that she I was walking around glassy eyed. She thought you know kids on the phone, thirteen years old with the friends. Okay, so I have no that's I have no memory of that. Do you have strong memory of what you were being told? I only remember. All I remember is uh, I, I was alone. I picked up the phone. I heard clunking, no, you know, I heard uh, like clunking noises, like relays going. I had just been to the Brooklyn Public Library where I picked up this big book on uh, computer, on um, computer, on switching circuits, electrical switching circuits. Okay, which was like the the uh, the, brain, the ANIAC machines that they were developing. And remember, this is 1953. Okay, I'm th- 13 years old. But a you know, precocious kid, and um, and uh, and so I hear clunking, you know, clunking sounds, and then I hear, you know, Stephen Hawking, the guy, the mm-hmm. the, the, guy, the, the the paralyzed guy, his voice, the right. met- metallic voice. I hear Stephen Hawking's voice, 1953. I didn't know Stephen, was there, but it's that kind of voice, metallic voice, and it's numbers, just repeating like numbers, uh, integers, just repeating integers. It's, it starts very slow. See, because I can uh, experience it now. It starts very slow, and it builds lot, volume, volume, and then it says, uh, Jack, then it starts talking to me. I said, who's this, right? And, um, and then basically it said, it was a conscious computer on board a spacecraft that they had I was one of a group of several hundred young, bright, receptive minds they wanted to teach their technology to, and that um, uh, if I, I had to agree, okay, and that if and if I said yes, they would. Uh, uh, I, I begin to meet the others in 20 years, which is 73, which is when I met Putoff and all these CIA guys. Okay, all right, and I remember at the time yeah, I was a smart, street-wise kid, and I knew about perverts. And I said, and at first I thought. Okay, it's a joke, right? I'm a, I'm a you know, smart kid from New York. And uh, then I realized, no, I can't. Well, none of my friends are smarter as me, and they wouldn't think of this. I was into science fiction. I could have thought of it. Okay. So I, none of my friends, I had these, you know, my Irish and Italian friends from the Civil Air Patrol. I mean, you know, they were just kids on the street, you know. Um, and, uh, and then, so, so maybe it's a, it's a, it must be an adult, right? It must be an adult. And then, when they when they said uh, give us your decision, when the metallic voice said give me you know give you your decision, I was conflicted because I was of course curious, but I was also afraid, and I remember. You're thinking this could be a trick. Yes. Yeah. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not an idiot. I'm even you know, I'm, you know. and uh, and but I remember I was thinking no. And I felt an electric like thing go from the base of my spine up to there. I didn't know about Kundalini. It was, it was just, and I heard myself. I heard myself, like involuntarily, say yes. When he asked whether you're willing to be part of this. Yes, the metallic voice. You, 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 voice. Wanted, you wanted to say no, but uh, uh, some type of charge went from your back to your brain yes. and made you say yes. Made me say yes, although I was in conflict because, you know, I also want to know what the hell's going on, right? I mean, because, you know, <laughs> this is like an adventure for me, too, the kid, right? Um, and um, and then, the, then it said... Then it said, good, go to your fire escape and we'll send a ship to pick you up in 10 minutes. Okay? At that point, I got scared. You know, I got spooked. You know, because I was... And it was a summer night. I ran, I lived, we lived on the third floor, I think. I ran like a cat out of hell out of my apartment. My mother wasn't there. I was by myself. And I ran downstairs in the streets, New York City streets. This is a, I, this is a Catholic German... Italian Irish neighborhood, <laughs> okay. okay, where my mom, I had, I used to, I, I had, uh, I could eat at Patty's Irish Bar, free food, and my mother was, was, was a character, everybody liked my mom, and you know, I was able to, uh, you know, every, 
you know, the the parents took care of the kids. You know, this was a whole different, this is like 19, you know, 1953, Brooklyn, Flatbush, right by, near Brooklyn College, Flatbush and Ostrand Avenue. I ran down, I had a gang. I find uh, N- N- Neil Legata and his brother uh, and uh, and my friend Winky. These are t- Winky's, a, he's a tough Irish kid. Later he went into the Marines, became uh, 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 a police, New York City police homicide detective. Okay, tough kids, and Neil and Norman Legata. I mean, and we were all in the Civil Air Patrol. We were, you know, this is these are like like, like tough kids. I said, Flying Saucer just contacted me. We gotta go upstairs. They're gonna come and get me. You know, <laughs> and this could be a movie, right? I mean, we run upstairs. We I mean, well, now we got my gang, right? I'm okay, <laughs> and we we go to the fire escape. Nothing ever happened. That was it. But you weren't by yourself. You were with the other guys. No, with the other guys. Yeah, we, we, so we, if no, you had no. gone there by yourself, we don't know what would have happened. We don't know what would have happened. I don't know. But I was okay. But so okay. So so that's uh, so I, I'm like I'm reliving it now. I'm not making this this thing up. I'm not that. You know. Well, and you certainly have no incentive to be no the no story incentive now because it, it seems to me your your chances of getting the Trump meeting go down the more that you talk Actually, about this crazy 1953 yeah, story. Yeah, but you know what? But maybe not because th- there's another thing. You know about Trump's uncle. I know that you referenced him. But Trump, tell Trump's me. uncle, his father's brother, yeah, uh, John Trump, MIT engineering professor, aerospace, uh, has the only guy who uh, has access to the had the Tesla papers when the when Tesla. A lot of this stuff, physics I'm ta- talking, relates to some of the Tesla work on. Uh, near electromagnetic fields. So, um, and then what was the guy who became Secretary of Defense was a student, John Trump. He had to resign because, they, I don't know, he beat up his wife or, or something happened with his wife. I'm not sure. You know, the guy who, who resigned before the present Defense Secretary was a student of... of Mattis? Of John, no, not Mattis. Uh, Secretary of Defense. Uh, uh, I forget his name right now. The yeah. uh, Secretary, he was a student of John Trump's at MIT Engineering Guy, and he had to resign to some scandal. He had to resign, and but in any case, it was John Trump's student who became Secretary of Defense, who I think released the Tic Tac papers. He had to do so. This whole thing is very, you know. There are connect. There are connections here. We know. We don't see. No, I think. Uh, I think Trump probably knows enough of what's really going on that he takes that he would take it seriously. I could, you know, I I could be with Trump. But, I have a close friend. Well, Michael Savage is a close friend of mine. Michael Savage is a close friend of Trump's. Trump calls him up, you know. Okay, Michael's been on Air Force One. He's been to Oval Office many times. Uh, and I know exactly, I, I understand Trump. I mean, I, I follow his tweets every morning. I see what he's, you know, where his mind is at. He's the most transparent president ever, okay? So, in any case, I'm telling the truth about what happened. Now, here's the thing. Now, why did it take so long? Let's get back to your, your why did it take so long? Um, it took so long because of the woo-woo factor, okay? And whenever I was asked about this, I would say, well, I don't know if this was really uh, what it pretended to be because prior to my phone call, it turns out I was examined by arm, by the Army because my grandfather worked for the Army. This is what between the ages of like 10 and 11, maybe 12. I was living with my grandparents. My grandfather was a, a drove uh, cars for the army at the uh, army quartermaster corps down in the garment district in Manhattan near the John Watermaker building, and uh, and that's because his son, my uncle Arthur, was a um, and uh, he was uh, four years in the South Pacific in combat. Okay, and he got a, a reputation. I won't go into all the details. He was on Guadalcanal, all kinds of stuff, and he. Uh, he got a reputation of being psychic. Like all, whenever they would go out on patrol, they want to go to Arthur. Because Arthur, he would just do. He'd see, he'd say, see, he'd, he'd see a Jap hidden. Pardon me, may not be politically correct. He'd see a Jap in, in, uh, you know, in the jungle in the tree, a sniper, and he'd see it and shoot it. So he had like this sixth sense. So they may have, because of my uncle Arthur, they may have been wanting to examine me to see. See, and then it was part of this project where they were looking for psychic powers. So in any case... Right. After, when, when was that project? Was that before or after your phone call? No, this is before the phone call. The Army The Army thing. You, before, and then what about the, the, the psychic that was project? A, that was after. That was after. That was after. That was high school. Uh, uh, so, but the point is, I would go down after school, 
I would go down, you know, get on the subway, go down to John Wanamaker Building and hang out with my grandfather. And, but here's the weird thing about it. I remember sitting in cars, army cars, in the back seat with these colonels, my grandfather driving the car, talking to me. And I was into science, you know, building rockets. And they, I realized these were army psychiatrists. They were testing me and they, they were examining me, right? Also, I was able to play. They had, I remember different floors. There was one floor where they had Arctic clothing, another floor jungle clothing, all this kind of like uniform. And I was given free reign, you know, kid. I was like 10, 11 years. I was able to go, it was like my playground. I, I would spend, you know, lots of time there. And then, now here's the weird thing, and I can't, I can't say for sure, because I may be manufacturing something here, but when I saw Colonel Philip Corso's picture in The Day After Roswell, it flashed, he was the guy in the back seat talking to me about, you know, we were talking about spying sources, all kinds of stuff. So I, and this was right around 1950, around that time. So there was a, you know, it may have been Corso, okay? And, and, I, and uh, okay, so, but here's the, so, okay, so now why, okay, so I knew I could, the, the, okay, the, the Army, I was involved, the, they were trying to get kids to work on these problems. They were worried about Roswell 47. I was told by a guy named George Koopman, who since dead, died under mysterious circumstances, Army guy, he said, the two things the CIA wants to know, how does consciousness work and how does sources fly? We basically that was given. I was given like a mission: work on those two problems, okay. And that's what I've been spending. And and some of these other guys, like Hal and so on, that you said you connected Except, with twenty years later, yeah, they're yeah, saying they the had same, similar yes. visitations. Well, I, the, the Hal talked. Uh, Hal, I had private. You have to have Hal come on your show and you ask him. Hal had some weird things happen to him as a kid around the same time, maybe a little bit before. I don't know other. Okay. Let me ask you this question: If it turns out that it was just a prank that happened to you in 1953. Yeah. Does, how does that affect See, your it can't. Okay, well, here's, okay, here's the thing. In other words, you could have developed this with your own brain as well, opposed to Well, that'd be visited. great. I don't think I'm that smart. I'm actually humble. I'm diffident, <laughs> modest, and shy. <laughs> At least in that way. <laughs> but no, no, here's the thing. Everything what you just said made a lot of sense until December 2017, till Tic Tac was revealed. See? Because that's like that was that's the cosmic trigger. That's the thing. That's like that's now I know what happened. I, when I say I know what happened, I mean ninety percent, ninety five percent probability. You know, confidence level. You know, what's called Bayes' theorem. You know, I mean, of because all what the you're saying when you first saw Tic Tac, that immediately caused your mind to go back to 1953, and you're saying that aha, that's what communicated with me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the thing is, just also, I know I, th I I now reject that it was just the CIA, Army, intelligence. I mean, it could be that that's part of it. It could be that, you know, it could be more complex. It could be both. It's not one or the other, right? It could be because some of these guys have also been contacted. Who knows? See, in as a matter of fact, what am I talking about? Andrea Paharic. Andrea Paharic was Army intelligence back in the, that, at that time, the late 40s, 50s, and he is a contactee. It could have been Andrea Paharic behind it because he pops up in my life all the time. And, uh, and Paharic was connected with, uh, oh, you know who, who else was involved in this? Who's the guy, the Scientology guy? L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard was part of it. And also, he was in it. And also, uh, Jack Parsons. You know about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he knows. Mike knows all this stuff. Uh, oh, oh, I know. I know Parsons' partner. I know uh, uh, Frank, Frank Molina. I was involved with Frank Molina in Paris. I mean, there's all these connections. There are all these little connections where you probe into it. It's all this like a tight network of coincidences. Can't all be a coincidence, okay? And um, so I mean, when you, so when you saw the Tic Tac, when that was finally in released, December of, of, of seventeen, everything's kind of. Then I know this is it. it look, it, it could be. It's an army. There, there certainly are, is a, an intelligence operation going on long term. I'm also friends with you know. I don't know if you know who James Jesus Angleton was. Do you know who he was? You know who James Jesus. Yeah. Well, I'm OSS, right? Huh? OSS. OSS, and but the, he was the he was the guy uh, in counterintelligence looking for the mole. You know. Uh, any case, his his grandson and I are close friends, you know, and and, and it turns out, um, uh, his grandson confirms that 
James Angleton was very worried about the UFO thing, that Roswell, that the CIA, when it was created, it was created partly because of uh, things like the Roswell stuff. crash, mm-hmm. okay? And there's all kinds of other things. I gotta be real careful because I have friends, I have, a, I have a friend who's a very well positioned guy, and I don't wanna mention, because he's involved with a very prestigious organization, who actually had possession of the Roswell material for a week. He was working for the CIA back in the late 60s, and there's a whole story there. Okay, so far, what you've told me causes me to think it is even more likely that, in fact, these Tic Tacs that were seen in, uh, was it, 04 and in 2015, are U.S. craft. And the reason I say that is, you've told me that this formula that you've come up with is very simple. You say you're the only one that has it, but you says that these other people are idiots not to know this. Maybe so they did get Okay, so, fair, so, 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 fair, so it's a simple, it's a real, fair, fair simple formula. And with billions of dollars, this could be, you know, a Manhattan-style project, as you said. Yeah. With billions of dollars, this could be built. Yeah. And we know that uh, the Black Project budget, according to uh, Nick Cook, I think, uh, is the yeah. one who told you know, has been over $30 billion per yeah. year for many for decades now, yeah. essentially, yeah. so that those monies could be going to have developed that, and the U.S. did, in fact, develop this. Okay. I agree with you. That's a reasonable proposition. Okay. The reason I don't think it's true is because of guys like Chris Mellon and Hal Putoff. Hal Putoff has held the highest security clearances possible, and he doesn't know. Chris Mellon you know, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence Pentagon doesn't know. Well, they say they don't know. No, no, I'm in touch. I'm close to touch. I, I can't. They, they would tell you if they no, knew. No, no, because I, the questions he asks, I know he doesn't know. He's very concerned about it. He just wrote a, oh, in fact, just read his article. He, uh, Chris just wrote an, uh, an article in the American Legion magazine. I think I sent it. Uh, you probably have it. And he's talking how this could be a Pearl Harbor. It's important. He, he, but, but, but couldn't these black projects be so siloed that even somebody with I don't the highest so. uh, uh, I don't, clearances. No, no, I don't think so because there's no way to keep something like that a secret for so many years. No way. It's going to leak. Well, I always, that's that was my original point until so I had experts on who told me that stealth technology was kept secret yeah, for decades. Yeah, but then the guy the guy who said is claiming that, he has given me a bunch of bullshit about the 1G if it's the same guy, right? No, this is just experts about, you know, the Nick Cooks of the world. Okay, well, uh, Nick it, Cook it, is working with me. I okay. work with, I'm, I'm, I'm Nick Cook, we're on the same team. So he told me a story. He, you know, I, I, I said, gee, I can't can't imagine this being able to be kept secret for at least two yeah. decades. And I believe it was Nick or maybe some other experts who said, well, actually, there have been technologies that have been kept secret that long. Yeah, but not this is too this is too dramatic a technology. And let's I mean, it's I don't I listen, I can't say you're wrong. I give what you're saying low, fairly low probability, maybe 25 percent probability. I think say, you know, 70, uh, my, my position, I'd say 75 percent probability. Uh, oddly enough. Uh, in October of 2017, I was with Hal Putoff and Kit Green in London when they were setting up the release of the information on Tic Tac. You know, they're, they're, they're part of the To The Stars Academy. Mm-hmm. What's that guy, the the rock star? What's his name? Tom DeLong. Tom DeLong, yeah. And, and we were, like, uh, doing things, and then a phone call would come in, and, and Hal would have to go out of the room for a private... He was probably talking to all these guys about releasing the information on Tic Tac, okay? But I know at the time that Hal had not a clue about how it really worked. Hal only had like half the thing. What Hal has done, Hal has published papers showing that if you had this kind of warp drive, Hal calls it metric engineering, and that's what it's called, metric engineering is the key word. If you had gravitational metric engineering, what Hal did was to show how what Commander Fravor, looking from the outside, would see. Fravor. David Fravor. Fravor. Yeah, yeah, David Fravor. Thank you. Uh, what he would see. But Hal had not a clue about how you can achieve that with small amounts of energy. You see, Hal was still under the impression it would take an enormous amount of energy. So how does it work? And I've solved the energy problem. And still, though, the real trick, you you, you say it's absolutely possible to do. It's yeah. actually somewhat if somebody Easy did it because the, 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 someone has done it. Someone has done it. It's just but, not but us. Would you say the biggest trick is going to be figuring out exactly how to make this metamaterial? Yeah, that's 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 analogous, to like trying to figure out Oak Ridge how to refine the required isotopes of uranium and plutonium needed to get a fission bomb, or or to solve the implosion problem to get a fusion bomb. Okay, it, that that's the engineering. That's the engineering physics part. That's mm-hmm. the hard part. 
By the way, one one more question I forgot yeah. to ask you about the, the the tic tac and this magnetic field and so on. Gravity field, gravity gra- field. Sorry, gravity field. Um, how how would that cause a disturbance? Say in the water, you know, they they talk about disturbance they saw in the water below yeah. the tic tac. Well, it would, could. That- it, 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 I mean, it doesn't have to. You have all kinds of. You could like you could, for example, if you want to, you could emit gravitational waves that would cause that disturbance. There could be some kind of communication with something that was happening. So you could do that, but you don't want to do it in terms of flight. You could use it as a weapon. You could beam these like a gravitational wave laser at something. I mean, you could do, there's all kinds of possibilities. Yeah, you can explain it with that. Mm-hmm. Once you control the gravitational field, you control everything. And what about it, it traveling underwater? Does it make sense sure. based on your thoughts? Oh, yeah, tic-tac go underwater because it's, yeah, it's just slipping. Sure, there's no problem. W- would it go under, would it travel underwater five, in the same way that it would travel through uh, space? Or, or, or uh, well, the, that's a, no, that's a good question, and I don't want to give a flip answer to that. No, probably not because though because when you're changing the gravitational field around the water, then you're making water waves and churning, and mm-hmm. yeah, no, it's not quite the same, mm-hmm. not quite the same. So, what about speed? Could it travel at the same speed underwater? Well, they said it traveled. Five, uh, the reports five hundred miles an hour, right underwater, right mm-hmm. USO. So, but ba- so, based on your conception of what this w- thing would be. Could it travel just as fast underwater, or do you think no? It'd be less. Probably because- not. Probably not. Oh. I, I don't listen. This is something that you know. I'm not an engineer. This, but it's a good question. I my guess, my 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 educated guess is that it would be more limited because the, the gravitational disturbance that could disturb the water. You could, and in fact, you did see disturbances in the water. Right. But, you know. And am, am I correct also that this uh, invention would not have that much utility? In space, per se, because you don't have gravitational pulls in space. No, no, no. It has a no, no. In, no, of course, in space. In space, you want to. It's a, it's a starship. You yeah. want to get. You want to get to an exoplanet. You want to build a wormhole, a stargate. You went. You have to engineer the gravitational field. There's plenty of gravity in, in empty space. I mean, the Earth, the sun is pulling all the planets. So there's gravitational. The, all you have. Well, is, but 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 there doesn't seem to me that there's such gravity that it inhibits. Yeah, but uh, you travel. Want, no, no, like but, what, what? What's the gravitational pull when I leave the Earth's atmosphere? Well, enough enough to control planet. The point is, you want it. You want to not, You want to do the same thing in space that you're doing in okay. the air, and you want to. You may want to make a wormhole to get from here to Alpha Centauri in two minutes. You know, and we go to Mars. Okay, okay. Here's the other thing. Hey, how, hey, how, hey, how hey fast Elon Musk, if you're listening. Elon Musk, if you're listening, Richard Branson, who's it? Branson, who are the yeah. other guys? Who are these Jeff other? Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos. This is the question I want to know. Yeah, Jeff Bezos, you're wasting your money, man. You're doing in science what Bloomberg's doing in politics. You're barking up the wrong tree. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's stupid. Developing rockets is stupid. And with that kind of money, Jeff Bezos, those guys, they can get this thing done in six months, maybe in one year. With that, with those kinds of resources, it doesn't even have to be the government. So this, of course, they don't know. Maybe, the, maybe if they listen to you, they may sort of. So the Tic Tac should be able to get from Earth to Mars in in how much time? Split second, in principle, through a wormhole. A couple of minutes. You walk through it. You can walk. We could set okay, with, what, with, what is, with metric engineering. We could set up a traversable wormhole connecting Earth with Mars, and literally. Millions of people walk through it, and they're just like going through a door, and there you are. You're and that right. would all be done with this metamaterial. Well, or with uh, maybe not so much this particular metamaterial, but with the kind. Once you have this basic insight, how to control the gravitational field, there's going to be other creative people coming in with all kinds of applications and ideas. Maybe metamaterial, maybe something else. See, I'm I'm looking at it from a very obviously simplistic view yeah. of, of gravity, yeah. right? Because I'm just thinking about We're the We're controlling fact that- the gravitational field with small amounts of energy. That's the key idea. And once you can do that, you can you But how, how does gods. that allow you to zip through the universe? That's the part that I'm because, not getting. But because what because gra- just to finish my thought, yeah. gravity is out there, but it's not that strong that we feel No, on no, Earth. but it's strong enough. 
It's strong enough. Okay. And so but I, it's not, is it the thing? But, but no, what gravity does, what you're able to do with a wormhole, you could collapse the distance between Earth and Mars in this alternate. Okay, and how do room. you create a wormhole from the Tic Tac? We've gone from Tic Tac to creating a wormhole. Connect those two things for me. Well, well, the, worm, the wormholes, can, because the wormhole is just a solution of Einstein's field equations as it's being generated from electrical energy. So you just have to have the computer design a gravitational warp field that will be a wormhole solution and connect with Mars. I'm not saying I know how to do it offhand, you know, <laughs> but we, the fact that the Tic Tacs, okay, let's put it this way. If Tic Tacs are here, they're time traveling from our future to our past. Okay, okay stop right that, there. Okay. You just explained that, hey, you could create a wormhole and we could travel somewhere super quickly anywhere in the universe. Yeah. So why couldn't that be what Tic Tacs are as opposed to from the future? Why can't they be from some other? They can uh, be. They can be, but they told me they were from the future. <laughs> yeah. They could. Okay. They told they me. They told you in 1953. Right. Okay. So I'm going on the basis. That's an, about what John Wheeler says. We have a few, what, ironclad, iron posts of facts covered with a paper mache of theory and speculation. Okay. So I'm just like, you know, what's the guy dragged it? Just a facts man. I'm, okay, I'm, so not, I'm not like a, like a cop. Okay, I was told they're from the future, and yeah, I was told that. So okay. let's. So I'm so running you, with you, it. You, you've you've talked about two multiple incredible concepts. Yeah. Yeah. We're on we're on at least three right now. Yeah. One is the tic tac and being able to design yeah. the tic tac and saying yeah. you know. Yeah. That. Two is being able to create a wormhole that would allow you to travel yeah. you know instantaneously throughout space and and, and, and time or, or, or and the time. universe. And then number three is. I'm calling it a third thing, which is time travel yeah. back in time. Yeah. Well, because they uh, let's and put you, it this, and you believe that's possible too. Well, I I'm saying that's the only way to understand the facts of Tic Tac. No, we we've already, oh, okay, we, we've okay. already come up with All two right, others. Okay, okay, One okay. is the U.S. invented it. The other yeah. is that it came from somewhere else in the universe. Yeah. Uh, okay, but my my understanding of it is because people like Chris Mellon and Hal Putoff haven't a clue. And they were certainly in the position to have okay. a clue. And because everybody I met in the government involved in DIA, stuff like that. No, I get it. I, I know why no. you don't think it's U.S. Yeah. Why don't you think it came from somewhere else in the universe? Uh, it's possible it did. But then why would they contact me and saying they were from the future? So, you know, and now everything is fitting together. Okay. So, okay. And then, because again, I it, can't, it, I can't it, exclude 19, it. 1953 still could it have been could a be hoax. Both. It still could have been a hoax. So could let's keep in mind hoax, that it, it could have been a hoax. So, what is your scientific explanation as to how something could travel back in time? Well, that's the whole, it's all wormhole physics. The point is this. Um, uh, that with a, with with a wormhole you can have time travel. Now there are arguments by Stephen Hawking and even Kip Thorne. They're trying to say that if you create a wormhole with time travel it back from the you know from future to, to past, that there's going to be some catastrophe. It, it doesn't happen. But uh, their arguments are basically hand waving. And what I'm saying is that their arguments have to be wrong because of the fact of the tic tac. I'm kind of, because they told me they're from the future. Everything, my best, let's put my best analysis. Everything is probabilities, right? My best judgment from everything I know and everything that's happening is that the most probable scenario is that their time travel is back from the future. And by the way, there's a bunch of other people independently coming to that conclusion. I'm not the only one. If you look at the coast, I was on coast to coast. There's this guy, Robert Masters. Uh, you know, and uh, he was a, he was not even a physicist. He's c just from empirical evidence. He's some kind of evolutionary anthropologist. Very smart guy. You should actually have him on, on your show. And so, let's put it this way: um, I'd say the prob the most probable thing that they're from the future. They could also be coming from elsewhere. They could be aliens, but you know, I don't see much evidence. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah. But both could be true. So both could let's be true. talk a little bit about what we know about time and space time because yeah. it's always fascinated me, yeah. this idea that time slows down as you speed up, yeah. right? And yeah. so uh, you could, the, the, the twin theory that you yeah, could have yeah. identical twins, one travels out yeah. in space yeah. And comes back yeah. and is much younger than. Yeah, the other well, that, that's not that's not a spe that's a fact. They've done that with mu mesons and cosmic rays. Yeah, it's, it's proven, right? Oh, that's proven. It, that's it's a fact. proven. Yeah, and, it's and proven. In fact, if you were on the space station, uh, it's like point zero zero one second uh, yeah. younger than you would have been yeah. if and you were on. Earth. If you see the movie Interstellar, mm -hmm. see all that is accurate. Uh, Kip Thorne, who I know, uh, Caltech professor, Feynman professor, uh, the expert. See if you. 
See, and, and that's the other thing. Kip Thorne, oh, the other thing, the other reason I know it's not our guys. Kip Thorne, his students, he has a lot of students, he and John Wheeler. John Wheeler had the highest level uh, secure, uh, security clearances. He, you know, he helped develop the H-bomb with, uh, with Ed Teller, who I also knew. And, uh, and Kip Thorne is a student. Kip Thorne, all of Kip Thorne has like 100 students. They run the Department of Energy. They run the NSF. They run all these programs. Lockheed, all these. They and I know what they know. I know what Kip Thorne knows. That's why I know it's not our guys. Because if anybody would know, it'd be Kip Thorne. But let me ask a question. Unless, about unless he says kept it so secret, I don't. I don't what, what, what about the fact though that you know we discover nuclear energy and what year yeah. do you attribute that to? The 30s. The 30s, yeah. Here we are, a hundred years later, essentially, and we've had no major new discovery yeah but, but let's doesn't that seem like I'm a getting, long time okay, to go okay now you could say this why is jack sarfati getting so much opposition from you know from the powers that be about this maybe because they don't want anybody to know okay you could say that so that's an argument i'm not giving an argument your favor right but we forgot the russians we forgot the russians we've got to talk about the russians now okay. russia, russia 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 right the russians all right, let, let, let's put a pin in Russian for a second. Just I want to finish the time travel yeah, thing. So yeah. what um, what we know and apparently is proven is that if you travel the closer to the speed of light, the faster that you go, the more time slows down. Correct. Yes. And so, but that has nothing can, to do with time travel. That I'm talking. Okay, good. That's I, I want to make that that's distinction. That's special relativity. Okay, let's I'm not talking about that. Okay, let's that's explain just, that to people. So yeah, I yeah. just want to make sure that first yeah. of all, yeah. Yeah. I understand that what we do know. Yeah, you're saying that's not time travel. I mean, to some extent, that's you only can time say travel into the future. It doesn't go into the past. Exactly. That's special. And relativity. even then, it's arguable that it's not really time travel. It's just that right. travel uh, time slowed down for you. But it is true that when you come back after five years in right. space, exactly. everybody on Earth is it's 50 years later. So in that exactly. ex extent, that's not you what have I'm traveled about. into the future. Yeah, you have into the future, but that's not exactly what I'm talking. Okay. about. Okay. So what you're saying is the time the 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 the, the, the time travel that we do know about that is proven. It's not related to, with, to what you're talking exactly, about, yes. which there's zero scientific evidence for, therefore. No, there is scientific. The evidence is the Tic Tac itself. The Tic Tac itself, and also my particular experiences, which is not, you know, you have to take a leap of faith that it actually happened. But there are other, there are other uh, yeah. So in any case, it's my, per, my educated guess is they're from the future. And you think that it, obviously you think, it is scientifically possible to travel back in time. Absolutely. And Absolutely. But there's no formulas for that yet. There's no... No, no, form. We have plenty of formulas. The formulas are out there. Even Kip Thorne, the formulas are out there. That would prove that that's possible. Oh, yeah. that's a, There's physical review. And there's, a, there's a whole industry of theorists showing how time travel may be possible, theoretically, in back terms in of Einstein. Yeah, back in time. There are, there are problems with it. Some people think that this, through quantum effects, there's going to be, as soon as the wormhole dev becomes a time machine, it's going to blow up. Well, they, they, they're doing that speculating on quantum gravity theories, which nobody really has a good quantum gravity theory yet. So, the, so the, that's just speculation. What I'm saying is that the fact of the Tic Tac revelations in December 2017 by the U.S. Navy, all this stuff shows that those speculations are somehow wrong. Because the fact is, because I was told they are from the future, and it makes sense that they're coming from the future. So, and I, I again, I could be wrong. Any good scientist okay, could let's be wrong. Let's... Thank you again to Dr. Jack Sarfati. Check him out on the web. He's all over the place uh, on the internet, as well as his book, Space, Space, Time, and Beyond, which you can find on Amazon. Thank you to our producer, Michael Parker. Thank you all for listening to The Hidden Juice Show. We'll be back with another episode.